Well, I love the old but true story of the actor Paul Newman. One occasion, a woman entered an ice cream store in Kansas City. And after making her selection, she turned around and found herself face to face with Paul Newman in town filming the movie Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. He smiled and said hello, and his blue eyes caused her knees to shake. She managed to pay for her cone and then left the shop heart pounding. When she gained her composure, she realized she didn't have her ice cream. So she started back into the store to get it and met Newman at the door. Are you looking for your ice cream, he said. She just nodded. He said, you put it in your purse with your change. <laughs> you know, the first time I heard that story, I laughed as you did. And then I asked myself this question, when was the last time the personal presence of Jesus swept you off your feet? Because you know what worship is about? It's about encountering the personal presence of Jesus. And it ought to sweep you off your feet. I want to think that through a little bit more with you today because in Deuteronomy, in the 12th chapter, we're told that worship is about encountering the personal presence of Jesus. I want to take you there to Deuteronomy 12. I'm going to read a few verses to you. Now, a lot of people, I, I've said this before, I'll say it again until you stop asking. Um, a lot of people have asked if we're going to go right through all of Deuteronomy, and the answer is no. Um, I, I wanted to take some highlights from this book and reflect with you on them, uh, because I think there's some things here that God wants us to think through. One of the questions I get asked often is, are you going to deal with all those commands in Deuteronomy where God asked his people to obliterate, wipe out all the other peoples? Um, I'm not going to deal with that for this reason. Last uh, fall, we did a series on Joshua called Promises where we spent a whole morning going through that. It would be easy for you to access online. You could go on our website. You could look at the sermon series called Promises. It's number four, and the title is Whose Side Are You On? And you would find that um, topic addressed there and at least to give you some food for thought on that one. So that's why I'm not going back to it. We, we did it uh, precisely a year ago right, right here at this place. But I want to read um, the first 14 verses in Deuteronomy chapter 12. It says, These are the decrees and laws you must be careful to follow in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess as long as you live in the land. Destroy completely all the places on the high mountains and on the hills and under every spreading tree where the nations you are dispossessing worship their gods. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and burn their Asherah poles in the fire. Cut down the idols of their gods and wipe out their names from those places. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way, but you are to seek the place. The Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. To that place you must go. There bring your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, what you vowed to give in your freewill offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. There, in the presence of the Lord your God, you and your family shall eat and shall rejoice in everything you've put your hand to, because the Lord your God has blessed you. You are not to do as we do here today, everyone as he sees fit. Since you've not yet reached the resting place in the inheritance the Lord your God has given you, but you will cross the Jordan and settle in the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, and he will give you rest from all your enemies around you so that you will live in safety. Then to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name, there you're to bring everything I command you, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, and all the choice possessions you vowed to the Lord. And there rejoice before the Lord your God, you, your sons and daughters, your men servants, maid servants, and the Levites from your towns, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own. Be careful not to sacrifice your burnt offerings anywhere you please. Offer them only in the place the Lord will choose in one of your tribes, and there observe everything I command you. If you were reading 
right through Deuteronomy and trying to get a handle on this book. Uh, you come here to a new division in the book that goes roughly from chapter 12, verse 1, right to the end of chapter 26. And it mirrors, if I could use that expression, chapters 1 to 11. Chapter 1 to 11 really rehearse in so many ways all the good things God has done for these people. Chapter 12 to 26 instructs them on how to respond to the God who has so richly blessed them. And the first response, as it always needs to be, is the response of worship. And that's what chapter 12 is about, worshiping a holy God. Now, you understand when you read chapter 12 that we're, we're not to worship any way that we see fit. That was in verse 4. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way. Verse 31, it says essentially, I think, the same thing. Um, if you go down to verse 31, it says you must not worship the Lord your God in their way. Um, in, in other words, God has some very particular ideas about the ways to be worshipped. And Deuteronomy 12 concerns proper or acceptable worship of God. Although the historical issues addressed in chapter 12 seem rather remote and distant from us, and they are, we'll find here some timeless principles of acceptable worship that apply as much today as when Moses laid them out way back here in Deuteronomy chapter 12. So I just, I just want to lay out for you some of these great principles of acceptable worship because we've done that and we're doing that today. You might do it in your home group. You may do it on your own when you're driving or wherever. But, but we need to know what acceptable worship is. Deuteronomy 12 will give us sound wisdom around that topic. So let me just trace out four things for you about acceptable worship that are just embedded here in Deuteronomy 12. Number one, acceptable worship calls for the renunciation of all other gods. Acceptable worship calls for the renunciation of every other god. That's verses 1 to 4, where they're told to remove the names and the gods and the paraphernalia of, of all these idols that the people worshipped. To remove the names of Canaanite gods was to remove their presence and to remove their power. Just as putting God's name in a place was to fill it with his nearness and availability. What strikes you when you start Deuteronomy 12 is that um, the, the gods of the Canaanites and the, the living God could not coexist together. They, they actually couldn't coexist. Their gods and their names were to, were to be removed, replaced with the name above all names. The change must be radical. One name was to replace all the other names. There was going to be a clear-cut name change. That's where worship starts. What's behind the text and what is true is that everybody worships something or someone. Everybody's a worshiper. You might worship yourself. You might worship money. You might worship pleasure. You might worship the living God. You might worship power or sex or any one of a number of things. But everybody worships something or someone. We were created, actually, to be worshipers. Now, to worship the true and living God, it means to identify the idols in my heart, and the heart can be an idol factory. And it's to take those idols out and replace them with the name above all names, Jesus. That's where true worship begins. Now, every idol doesn't necessarily have to be completely eliminated. It has to be put in its rightful place. For example, an idol is what takes first place. So uh, if an idol is money or sports or sex, for example, it needs to be put in its rightful place and replaced with the name of God. God's name, Jesus, and the idol of you name it cannot coexist at the same level in your heart. Uh, it's his name and his name only, which is where this text is taking us. And there's, a, there's actually, it's very interesting, but there's actually a line that runs from this text, Deuteronomy 12, right through Isaiah 45, and it, and it lands in Philippians chapter 2, um, verses 9 to 11, which verses Ken read to us, where it says there that God has taken the name Jesus and exalted Jesus to the highest place and given him a name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, what? 
every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Um, these texts, Deuteronomy 12, Isaiah 45, uh, Philippians 2, were written in, against the background of religious pluralism. The text denies the names of other deities and religious traditions of the world, denies that they can be valid and lead to salvation or lead to a personal encounter with God. This text denies that. Pluralism is the reverse of our text, actually. God's name and, 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 and the name above all names, Jesus, will not coexist with any other name. That's why when Jesus came, he denied the fact that all roads ultimately lead to God. Jesus came and got him in a lot of trouble, as it still does today. And he said, I am the way, I'm the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to God the Father, Jesus said, except through me. That is exclusive. But the good news is it's also inclusive, because whoever will can come through Jesus. Paul, picking up the theme at least in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, says there, there's one God... And there's, there's one mediator who is between God and people, man, the man Christ Jesus. One God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So the acceptable worship uh, starts with the elimination of all other names. And so when you come into this place today, I trust your hearts have been prepared. And you've set apart in your heart Jesus as Lord. So that when we sing and when we pray and when we listen, it's his name alone that's worshipped. Secondly, acceptable worship focuses on the person of Jesus Christ. Acceptable worship focuses on the person of Jesus Christ. It would be a good question to say, where do you get that in Deuteronomy 12? Um, I've read it through, um, I don't know how many times, and I've never seen the name Jesus there, and yet that principle is there, that acceptable worship focuses on the person of Jesus. It's right there in verse 5, actually. Verse 5 says, You are to seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. To that place you must go. Several times over, the verses I read to you, it says, You don't just worship anywhere. Um, God will choose a place to put his name. That's where you go to worship. Um, the idea was that when God chose a place, it would be the place of his presence. So you would go to that place of his presence and you would worship. Now, what happens with that as you travel through scripture? Well, he's chosen a place. He, he, he has a tabernacle, a temple that's built by Solomon and, and then destroyed and rebuilt and so on and so forth. But when you come to the New Testament, what happens is this. It's a powerful verse. It's Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19. This is what it says. It says, For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell or live in the person of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? God has now been pleased to make the place of his full presence Jesus Christ. That's an awesome statement. God was pleased to have his fullness dwell or live in Jesus. So the place of worship is no longer geographic, but today it's a person, Jesus Christ. That's the place of worship. Um, in other words, I don't need to run to Reading to encounter the living Jesus. He, he surely would be there, but he's not, he's not stuck in a geographical place. I mean, Jesus inhabits the praises and the presence of his own people. Um, so worship focuses on the person of Jesus. That's where God is pleased to have his fullness dwell. So how does that actually work? Let me, let me try and bring this down to um, kind of where we're at here at Crossroads today. This is how it works. The Holy Spirit is the true worship leader in any worship service. Not Pastor Ken, but the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit does in a worship service is, is he shines a spotlight on Jesus Christ. He lifts up Jesus' name and Jesus' work, and he exalts Jesus. And when he does that, what we do is we bring our songs and our hymns and our thanksgiving and our prayer and our praise, and we put it at the feet of Jesus. You know what Jesus does with it? He gathers it all up 
and he perfects it. I'm glad he does that. And then he presents it to the Father, the center of the universe, on our behalf. That's worship. That's what really happens. Um, and he speaks to us as we wait in his presence. So practically how that works in a setting like this is Ken Lehman, who is our worship leader today, he spends time during the week getting in touch with the Holy Spirit, listening, asking, getting counsel, to get a sense of what the Holy Spirit wants to do today in worship. The songs that you sang today, Ken picked after listening to the Holy Spirit, knowing that he would lead us through the service. We knew it was a remembrance weekend. So we, Dallas, uh, Wilma, myself, Wally, um, Ken, we all, we sat together and thought, how would the Holy Spirit want us to honor the people that have served us and laid down their lives for us so we did what we did? I, my job is to listen, to ask God what he wants to say and how he wants to say it. And to the best of our ability, we put our heads together and we say it seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit that this is what God wants to do in this place today. But we actually listen during the service too. And sometimes we, we change on the fly because we just sense God is up to something because we all know that it's not Ken. It's not myself. It's not the drummer, Nelson. It's it, what it is. The focus is on Jesus. And if you it, come into this place and you experience his presence, there's nothing better than that. And if you leave today with his name on your lips, that's the best day we could ever have. Um, it's about Jesus. So acceptable worship focuses on the person of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a third point from this chapter. Acceptable worship includes all those people that God has accepted and welcomed. It includes those people that God has accepted and welcomed. If you look down at the text in verse 12, it says, There rejoice before the Lord your God. You, your sons and daughters, stop there. The idea there is that families ought to come together to worship. Um, just a little bit further up in verse 7, They're in the presence of the Lord your God. You and your family shall eat and rejoice. It's the families that come together to worship. They, um, they, they come together in the presence of the Lord. It's the, the, the kids don't get dropped off at sports, and then the parents come here. We, we come together as families to worship God. That's what we do. That's what Christians have always done, way back to Moses' day. Children, hear, worship, accept, follow, get baptized, walk in the way of the Lord. You, your sons, your daughters, and then your men servants and your maid servants, the people that serve you, your employees, uh, the Levites from your town, the, the, the religious leaders, they come together too. So there's this sense in which everybody that God is welcome comes together. Now, chapter 14 and 16 of Deuteronomy expands this to include these people in chapter 16 and verse 11. Still the context is worship. It says, Rejoice before the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. You, your sons, your daughters, your men servants, maid servants, Levites, the aliens, those, those are um, refugees or immigrants, the fatherless and the widows, the single parents living among you, they all come together to worship. See, worship has this um, dimension to it that everybody that comes whom God has accepted is accepted at this place, and we're all on level ground. Why? Because the cross levels us all. There's nobody that gets in because of money or power or looks or anything else. All distinctions are erased at the foot of the cross. Economic distinctions are erased at the foot of the cross. The rich man and the poor man both cry out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Distinctions of gender are erased at the cross. Distinctions of um, age erased at the cross. You name it. At the cr on the cross, there's level ground. And we accept one another. And I want to say this properly. I don't want to say it wrong. We don't get so caught up with God and worship that we forget the people beside us whom God has loved and Jesus has died for. Everybody in this place who has come in the name of Jesus is accepted and welcomed. Another way of saying it would be there's no second-class citizens in the presence of Jesus. None at all. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we make room for all those that Jesus loves. Now let me, let me give you a breather. Um, 
it's really interesting to read you when I try and speak. Um, sometimes you glaze over and sometimes you wander away and sometimes you're here. I'm not quite sure, so I'm going to tell you a story to try and get you back. But um, there was a preacher in my day. Uh, if you're my vintage, you would remember the name Charles Swindoll or Chuck Swindoll. He's now a man about 78 years old, but he still preaches in a, in a city called Frisco outside of Dallas, Texas. You could still catch him preaching there. Well, Charles Swindoll uh, was preaching one day at a conference that Ginny and I went to back in 1984 in Sacramento, California. And I'll never forget the story he told. He said, I was preaching in my church. In those days, he was in Fullerton, California. And he said, I had a well-heeled congregation in a full church every Sunday. People wore suits and ties and all that kind of stuff. And um, he said, partway through my sermon. In other words, the service had rolled out like it did here. Partway through my sermon, the back door opened, and a man walked in who obviously hadn't been in church much before. And he, he wasn't dressed like we were. He didn't smell like we smelled. And people were kind of uncomfortable because he, he was trying to find a spot, but there was no spots. And he, he was walking down the aisle, stopping and looking, and people would actually fill out the pews to make sure that there was no room crazy, hey? He got right down here, right about second or third row from the front. And Chuck Swindoll didn't know what was going to happen. When a, when a man on the end of the pew pushed over and said, friend, why don't you sit with me? And he made room for him. And uh, Chuck said, for the rest of my sermon, that guy, he just, he just started asking questions to the man he was sitting beside. Like, who's that guy up there and why is he talking so long? And what's that book in his hand? And why, you know, why, 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 why? And this gentleman just patiently worked with him. Well, at the end of the service, Chuck Swindoll was up near the front, and this man came up and um, more or less said, I'd like to come to your house for lunch. <laughs> so Chuck said, we took him home, and the whole family was there, and we had supper or lunch together. And um, he said, in the middle of lunch, this, this man said, you know what, I'm going to be a preacher like you one day. And he said, everybody just laughed around the table or tried to suppress it. You know how he ended the story? He ended the story by saying, that man is now a pastor in a church down the road from mine, and my kids go to that church, Chuck said. It, it, it started with one man saying, friend, there's room for you here. See, in worship, we say over and over and over and over again that every single human being has been made and created in the image and likeness of God and it has the utmost value in God's eyes and the precious blood of Jesus was shed for everybody. You don't have to feel second class here. You say, well, I'm divorced and I feel so less than because I've been divorced. You know what you need to hear? You need to hear the Father bend down in the presence of Jesus and your friends here and say, you know what? I get it. I've walked that walk too, and it's painful. You need to hear him say, you know what? I remember when I had to write a certificate of divorce for Israel and send them away, and it hurt. I get it. You're safe with me and with my people here. You say, well, you know, I'm a single parent and I've just been beat up by life and beat down and maybe physically beat up by someone that shouldn't have beat you up. And I just feel so second class. You know what I think he might do to you? I think in his powerful presence, he might bend down and lift up your head, your eyes, until you look straight in his eyes and you see the joy in his eyes because you showed up to worship him today. You say, you know what? I'm a moral failure. I made choices that if I could ever redo it, I would never do that thing, but I can't get it back, and I'm so broken and so guilty, and I'll never, ever be the same. And you're losing hope, and maybe your last shot is being here today. You know what you need to hear Jesus say? I shed my blood for your moral failure, and that's sufficient to pay your debt. And you know what? I am well able to take you and present you faultless before the presence of my Father at the center of the universe with great joy. Just 
trust me. That's what he might say to you. Well, you might say, well, I, I just feel like I haven't lived well, and I'm so hot and cold, and, you know, I come and I get so pumped up by this worship and this stuff, and yet, you know, before the week's half over, I've lost it all, and I just, you just, you feel guilty because you haven't, you just haven't performed well. You know what I think you need to hear Jesus say today? It was never about your performance. It was about mine. And the Father accepts my life on your behalf. That's why I could pay the penalty for your sin. What you need to do is trust me and ask me for my spirit, who I will give you, who will empower you to walk in my ways. See, acceptable worship means that all are welcome in this place and in the presence of Jesus, who Jesus has welcomed because he shed his precious blood for you. Fourthly and lastly, acceptable worship. Acceptable worship is marked by wholehearted rejoicing and joy. It, it, it ought to be a joyful time. I, I, two times, again in the text, verse 7 and verse 12. There in the presence of the Lord your God and, and your families, you shall eat and rejoice. And in verse 12, um, same kind of thing. It's, it says, there rejoice before the Lord your God. It says that the sense here is that because of all that God has done for us, we, we celebrate with great joy, and, and, and joy actually is very, very important to God. Um, there's, a, there's a chapter that most people will never read. I think it's Leviticus 26. It's long, and maybe it's cumbersome at points, but in the middle of that chapter, God's, the heart of God's grievance against his people, you know what it is? They just didn't serve me with joy. They don't really get who I am and what I've done for them. And they haven't served me with joy. I think it was Lewis, C.S. Lewis, who said the, the serious business of heaven is joy. If that's the serious business of heaven, it ought to be the serious business of God's people when they gather together in their homes or in their communities like this to worship the living God. It, it starts, I suppose, when we rehearse all of the great things that God has done for us. You know, in my mind, you say you're paid to say this. You can say that if you want. I don't care. In my mind, if we would take this as the very highest point of our week, the gathering together in the presence of Jesus to worship him and to listen to him, I think we would come far better prepared and our joy would overflow. If we could just but rehearse, maybe Saturday night, some of the great things that God has done for us. He has forgiven all of our sins. He has healed all of our diseases. He has redeemed our life from the pit. He's crowned us with, with his love and compassion. He's renewing us inwardly day after day after day. He's given us a hope that outlasts the grave. And each new day he doesn't fail. And from the fullness of his grace, we have each received one blessing after another. If you let that hit your brain... Imagine what it would be like on Sunday morning when we come into the powerful presence of Jesus. Acceptable worship to God is marked with joy because we get what he's done for us. So I want us just to worship, and um, I'm going to invite you to stand, and, I, and I just, I'm going to pray that God's Spirit would just help us to rejoice before him this morning. You know what? Sometimes it's a cold and broken hallelujah, but it's hallelujah. He waits to hear it. He longs to hear it from your lips. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your son Jesus. We thank you that he lives, that he speaks, that he prays to you about us. We thank you that we can gather in his name and we pray that his powerful presence would somehow sweep us off our feet today. Father, you've given us your Holy Spirit to help us worship. Would you help us worship with all of our hearts? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.